Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Campbell McCrary, and I'm a Vice President of Capital Markets at Anvest Capital in New York. Welcome to the Anvest Capital Inc. live webinar with Wheaton Precious Metals. Wheaton trades on the TSX, the NYSC is WPM, uh, Whiskey Papa Mike. We hope that you'll enjoy today's program. It will also be available in replay mode later. This link will work, and uh, other replay links that you get, and any ones that you forward, uh, will also work. Please feel free to chat in your questions in the question pane of the GoToWebinar control panel or simply email them in. We'll try and ask the questions in real time or uh, follow up with you after the webinar. Um, Anvest Capital uh, is a New York-based specialist investment management and corporate finance firm focused solely on the natural resources sector calls, uh, hosted by Anvest Capital Inc. All opinions expressed do not reflect the opinions of Ambas Capital or any of its affiliates. This call is for informational purposes only. It's not constitute an offer to sell uh, or the solicitation of an offer to sell or buy any security and should not be relied upon as a basis for investment decisions. Ambas Capital Inc., its affiliates and clients may maintain positions in the digital assets or securities discussed in this call. Um, presenting today is Randy Smallwood, uh, Randy is the president and CEO of Wheaton, and you know, honestly, barely needs an introduction. Um, he is a geological engineer by background and was involved in the founding of the company in 2007. Uh, he was also an instrumental part of the team that built the original Wheaton River Minerals uh, and that got folded into Gold Corp, and one of the largest and more importantly, most profitable gold companies in the world. Uh, he serves on several boards and uh, is an active philanthropist, um, both in, in the health world and um, gives back to the mining community in um, uh, education and things like that. Uh, following the formal presentation, members of AMVEST will ask questions of management. We look forward to any attendee questions that are also sent in. And um, with that, thank you, uh, Randy. Yeah, Cam, thank you for that uh, introduction. Uh, and thank Thanks everyone for dialing in. Um, I'm hoping that uh, you can all see the cover page of our presentation here. I'm gonna spend about 15, 20 minutes going through a presentation and then look forward to questions and answers. All good. There will be, uh, there will be some forward looking statements made uh, during the course of this presentation. There are risks associated with those forward looking statements. Uh, they're buried in the fine print down here and also in the appendices uh, which are included in our website. So I urge you all to understand those risks associated with forward-looking statements. I can't uh, start off this presentation without making a comment with respect to the current world. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm here in my uh, house in Vancouver, uh, British Columbia, Canada. Uh, we've been working from home for, uh, this is now our fifth week. Um, and uh, you know, it's, uh, it's, these are uh, <laughs> tumultuous times. Uh, um, health and safety has always been a, a very, very high priority for our company, but we're also a very small company that has, has always been very agile and, in fact, have had uh, good, strong business continuity plans in place. And so, uh, you know, to be honest, the, the, the transition towards a work from home environment has been relatively seamless. Uh, I hate to say it, I might be even a little bit more productive on a work from home uh, space than I would be in the office. but. Uh, but there's no doubt that we uh, at Wheaton have also had a bit of a negative effect from uh, from these uh, you know, from this pandemic. Uh, mainly, the impact has been some suspensions and deferrals of production from uh, some of our partner operations. Obviously, Mexico and Peru are very important countries for us, and with uh, government mandates to suspend production for periods of time while they uh, manage uh, and try and manage the risk associated with uh, COVID-19. Uh, something that we strongly support. We've seen uh, and in constant uh, communications and have seen good efforts on, on the part of all of our partners in terms of trying to manage this risk. Um, um, you know, I think if there's any time where the importance of the quality of our portfolio uh, will become apparent, it is in times like this. Um, our production, 88% of our production comes from the bottom half of respective cost curves. That means that these mines, not only are they profitable for us, they're very profitable for our partners, and they also deliver very good value back to the communities and to the countries that host those assets. And so as we see our partners and, uh, 
and countries and jurisdictions around the world try and reestablish and restart the economy, uh, I expect our operations will be uh, leading that charge on a go-forward basis and uh, uh, know that our partners are committed towards that. From a, from a company perspective, Wheaton, we are in great shape. Uh, we Even with the suspensions, we expect to be doing well over $500 million in, in, in free cash flow this year. From our production, we have had to suspend our production guidance for the year, which was originally uh, just up over 700,000 ounces of gold equivalent production. However, um, you know, we're still pretty comfortable with the majority of our operations uh, continuing to manage the risk and, uh, and deliver metal to us over the course of this year. It's still pretty excited about uh, our, our portfolio. And, uh, you know, it is something that, that is uh, overall very, very important to us. We, uh, you know, we're doing everything we can to find ways to provide additional support to our uh, partners and, uh, and, um, and really uh, just hope that everyone stays safe and healthy through this uh, process. Uh, I'm confident that we'll wind up, all of us will wind up being stronger and, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, through the course of this, there is light at the end of this tunnel, and uh, we will get there. And uh, look forward to everyone uh, staying safe and healthy through this journey. So, so who is Wheaton Precious Metals? Well, um, Wheaton Precious Metals, 15 years ago, came up with a uh, this the streaming business model. Streaming has got a lot of benefits uh, over traditional uh, methods of investing into the, uh, uh, in our case, the precious metal space. Streaming business model is a, is a, is a good, strong business model um, that, that delivers value um, to our partners and at a, at a greatly reduced risk profile. Our vision at Wheaton, of course, was, as, was and has always been to be the world's premier precious metals investment vehicle, and we, uh, we continue to strive to deliver that to our uh, shareholders. We do that through our mandate, and our mandate is to deliver that value through that streaming business model. And that streaming business model uh, goes towards our, you know, most importantly, all of our stakeholders. And that includes, of course, our shareholders. That's who I work for. That's who my management team works for, my board reports and represents. Uh, we, uh, we deliver that value through delivering low risk, high quality, high margin, diversified exposure and growth potential uh, from profitable precious metals production around the world. Um, it's, it's a good, strong business model that has very low risk profiles, uh, especially compared to traditional mining investments. To our partners, the companies that are actually operating these mines that, uh, that, uh, that we supply the capital to, we crystallize the value of a non-core, typically a non-core precious metal uh, from these assets and yet uh, and, and that is yet to be produced. But not only that, we do lots of work with our partners to try and deliver long, longer term value. We have a mantra in our company, the stronger our partners are, the stronger we are. And so we're always looking for ways to provide support, to strengthen our partners, to make sure that, that we're doing everything we can to uh, make this a mutually beneficial relationship. And, uh, and one, of that, one of those areas is, of course, uh, our third set of stakeholders, which is our neighbors. Neighbors around where our employees are, of course, the communities that our employees all live in, but uh, perhaps more importantly, the communities around the mines that deliver us the metal that we receive, our gold and our silver, our precious metals. And so we have a very strong and active program in terms of providing support to our partners so that they can strengthen their relationships with their neighbors on a go forward basis. Uh, and this is uh, particularly important in times like this. I mentioned streaming several times now. It's, a, it's an incredible business model uh, that delivers high upside to our, to our shareholders with much lower risk profiles than traditional precious metals investments. Um, you know, from, from, a, uh, from a, uh, 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 um, the upside perspective, we, we offer commodity price leverage. We have a base operating cost that on a per ounce basis that is, that is fixed by contract and predictable. And so there's no cost surprises, which is something that, that all of us that have invested into the mining space traditionally have always suffered, uh, suffered from. There is no cost surprises in the streaming space. Uh, expiration upside and optionality we deliver that both to uh, both of those to our to our shareholders by by access to life of mine agreements and because our assets are such high margin high quality assets expiration dollars are always first focused on these type of assets in terms of trying to grow and expand these uh, these uh, operations as i mentioned on the lower risk side our costs are predictable our capital cost is the upfront payment 
And our operating costs are fixed by the contract uh, and, and, and predictable. Very, very important uh, differentiator compared to traditional investments. We also have tax competence. Uh, for a number of years, we, we were in a, uh, a dispute with the Canada Revenue Agency. However, a couple of years ago, we settled it. And I and I, I like to point out that it is an agreement. It is not a court victory that is subject to appeal. This is an agreement. This is a handshake that that we have now tax confidence in our business model. And there is a much lower risk compared to some of our peers. Sustainable dividend. Our dividend is attached to our cash flows and to our. Uh, it's you know it's a function of a percentage of our cash flows on a go forward basis. And so a good strong dividend policy. Uh, that now is delivering the highest yield in the peer group. And of course, the highest quality assets. Um, our asset base, I would put up against anyone in the precious metals industry um, in terms of the quality of these assets going forward. So, so many advantages over owning either mining companies or traditional bullion or ETFs directly. I've mentioned the high quality asset base a couple of times now. This slide really sort of highlights the, uh, you know, uh, this slide and the next one highlight this uh, this high quality asset base. As you can see, we've got 20 different mines delivering us metal right now and nine different development projects. Those 20 mines, a real strong focus in Mexico and Peru. Our company was traditionally silver focused, but about six years ago, we shifted towards gold and we're actually now more of a gold company than silver. 60% of our revenue comes from gold, about 35% of our revenue comes from silver and 5% comes from palladium right now. So key point here is that you can see the jurisdictions that we operate in. Generally, very low political risk, good, strong jurisdictions, uh, which is important when we have long life assets in our portfolio. We want to have political stability. Uh, the other thing I like highlighting here is the list of our partners down the side, and it just highlights how important or how, how valuable the streaming business model has become as a source of capital for the mining industry. You can see that partners, the big diversified companies like Vale and Glencore and, and the big gold companies like Newmont and Barrick, uh, they've all uh, taken advantage of streaming as a source of capital. Streaming delivers a competitive source of capital to the entire mining industry, whether you're a big diversified company or whether you're a small single asset company like Alexco or Gold X. Uh, these are all good, strong uh, across the entire mining spectrum. Uh, streaming has become an active source of capital, a competitive source of capital. The second slide, this slide probably differentiates us compared to even our peer group or even beyond the streaming space. Um, I would argue that our precious metals portfolio, our production portfolio, our asset base is the highest quality asset base in the entire precious metal space. 73% of our production comes from the first quartile. Another 18% comes from the second quartile. Uh, sorry, 15% comes from the second quartile. And so 88% of our total production comes from the bottom half of the respective cost curve for the principal commodity at our partner mining operations. These are the highest profit, the highest margin, most profitable uh, metal mines in the world that we've invested into. And these mines, what's important there is that these mines will continue to operate through low commodity prices, but more importantly, it's the first place that our partners, we invest to expand, to explore, to grow, to develop, uh, and we get the benefit of that through these life of mine agreements. And we can see that. We have a reserve base that's 33 years long and another 33 years of resources beyond that, over 60 years of reserves and resources. These are very, very profitable mines that have a very, very long life. I would argue, again, that this is the highest quality portfolio with the diversity that we have, the highest quality portfolio of assets in the entire precious metal space. Our production profile, um, as I uh, mentioned earlier, we have had to withdraw our 2020 guidance. Uh, 2019 was a very good year for us. In the end, we produced uh, just over 700,000 gold equivalent ounces. That was based on guidance of 690,000 gold equivalent ounces. We have been uh, uh, tracking guidance and beating guidance for eight years in a row. Obviously, with uh, the issues that we're seeing around the world uh, with respect to this pandemic on COVID-19 and some of the mining suspensions and deferrals, we've had to suspend the 2020 guidance. Our original guidance was for, uh, again, just slightly over 700,000 gold equivalent ounces uh, over the course of 2020. 
Our five-year guidance we haven't changed yet. We still feel that there's a reasonable chance of, uh, of uh, beating that 750,000 gold equivalent ounce, mainly because we've got some substantive growth opportunities in a number of projects organically within our existing portfolio. That's uh, projects like uh, Constancia with the Papa Cancha zone that's expected to be up and running by next year. A much higher grades. We should see uh, a real kick start in gold production, uh, gold deliveries from the Papa Cancha zone when it gets running at Constancia. Penasquito, the silver uh, mine down in, uh, or it's a gold mine down in Mexico, but we get silver from it. New Montes has really embraced that asset and is moving it forward. Uh, we've seen good, strong production at Penasquito and uh, the best grades in that ore body are coming over the next four to five years. And so we're going to see uh, a dramatic uptick in silver production from Penasquito to our credit. Of course, Salobo going through its third phase of expansion, increasing throughput, throughput capacity by 50%, a 50% increase in throughput capacity expected to come online in 2022 and 2023. Sometime uh, it should be turning on in 2022 with uh, reaching full capacity in 2023. Uh, that will be a substantive increase in our gold production. Boise's Bay, of course, we start to receive cobalt at the start of uh, 2021. Uh, that project uh, currently open pit mining and, uh, this, um, and, and phasing into an underground operation with excellent exploration potential. Again, a, uh, a, another life of mine agreement that will deliver metal to us for, uh, for a very long time. The Stillwater Mine in Montana, uh, we get both gold and palladium from the Stillwater mine, and, and again, they've got uh, Sabanya has got a, a very aggressive fill of the mill campaign underway at, at both the mill sites uh, on the Sabanya or on the Stillwater operations. And so, both the Stillwater and East Boulder mines have uh, plenty of capacity to uh, to continue and increase production. So, good strong organic growth profile that should easily see us. Uh, average over 750,000 gold equivalent ounces over the next five years. And that doesn't count any of our optionality that comes from projects like Rosemont down in Arizona, a great copper deposit that's going to produce 30 to 40,000 gold equivalent ounces to our credit over uh, over its life. The uh, Pascualama project um, down in Argentina slash Chile that Barrick uh, is continuing to reassess and look at how to bring back into, uh, into production. And the Navidad project in Argentina with Pan American Silver. Uh, again, projects that I think even have a more likely chance of moving forward as, as countries and jurisdictions around the world try and kickstart their economies on the tail end of, uh, of, this, uh, of this pandemic crisis. And it doesn't include any potential additional opportunities that we may acquire over the next while. This is a very active time for us. Uh, again, the need for capital is consistent in the mining industry. And the need for capital in today's world is, is even more stronger than it ever has been. We are very active on that front. And so I would expect over the next five years for us to continue adding on additional production. If there's a slide that highlights the strength of the streaming model, this is it. Um, you know, the costs are predictable. They're, 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 they're fixed by contract. And so there's no surprises. And what's really important to recognize here is that when we see an increase in commodity prices, that increase is delivered to our shareholders directly. You don't see costs chasing that up. And you don't see, like most mining companies, where they run at a relatively consistent margin and chase uh, lower grade material becomes ore and, and starts getting processed. With us, when we see silver go up $5 an ounce, we see gold go up $200 an ounce, that entire value is delivered back to our shareholders. We get the benefit of that because our operating costs are fixed by contract. Good, strong, healthy margins, a good, strong business model that delivers that value. I mentioned our opportunity set in terms of new acquisitions. Our balance sheet is strong. We, uh, for the last six years, have utilized a $2 billion revolver to fund our growth. Uh, we've used it very effectively. We've invested over $6.5 billion into new ass assets over the last six and a half years. And... Um, and and had to uh, very uh, not uh, outside of about 1.5 billion dollars in equity financing. So we have not had to tap. We have not diluted our existing shareholder base. Uh, our our approach has always been uh, to use low price debt, low cost debt, to uh, to fund the differentials between very lumpy acquisition schedules and our very very consistent cash flows. 
As I mentioned, with our original guidance, we expected to, to be generating well over 700 million in free cash flow this year. We've now rescinded that guidance, but I don't see any reason why we shouldn't be substantially over 500 million in free cash flow this year. Current net debt, or I shouldn't say current, but as of the end of December 30, uh, 31st of uh, 2019, so as of the end of 2019, our net debt was in around 700 and change. And so uh, 700 and change million. Plus. So still plenty of capacity. And as I mentioned, we are active on the corporate development front looking for new opportunities to continue adding uh, um, additional production to our pro portfolio. This is what happens when we see a bull run in commodity prices. And as, uh, as we speak, we see good strength in both gold prices and I think silver is starting its move also. Uh, back in 2011 and 12, the last time we had a bull commodity price cycle, um, and we saw high gold and silver prices. We generated an additional $2 billion in free cash flow over that uh, short period of time. And I just want to remind everyone that with a 60 year reserve and resource life, I know we're gonna see a bunch more bumps like that. And it's worth highlighting that we are now producing more than twice the metal that we were back then. And so the exposure, the, uh, the, uh, the optionality, the leverage that we deliver through this business model um, just generates huge returns for us and our shareholders. Our dividend is uh, is a function of uh, of our cash flows. We set a basement every year. Our basement this year is ten cents per share, and so we will maintain that ten cents, well, minimum of ten cents per share for the duration of 2020. Uh, as you can see, our yields are higher than our peer group. Um, I don't see any problem why over time this 30% of, uh, of cash flow doesn't climb higher. As our, as our company gets larger and larger, uh, the cash flows that we're generating are gonna be so strong, I don't think we'll be able to put it back into the ground as fast as, uh, as we receive it. And so uh, that's when we start returning it back to our shareholders through the form of the dividend. So long term, I see continued growth in this area, uh, but we're already uh, delivering higher yields than any of our peers. So the benefits to partner mining companies. So this, this comes down to why would a mining company actually do a, a, a stream? Why would they use a stream financing? And, and you can see all the benefits that it adds compared to the traditional sources of capital, which is equity or debt. Um, you know, really the two key points that give streaming the advantage is the second one and the third one. It's the initial value creation for both parties and then it's the improvement and the return on invested capital or, or internal rate of return that these projects see. Everything else does deliver value, but really those two are the key, key points on a go-forward basis. And they're highlighted on this, on this slide here. The top half of this relates to uh, the arbitrage in value. When we take precious metals from a copper asset or a lead zinc asset, and we bring it into our precious metals company, and even if we bring it from a, a higher cost state of silver from a gold mining company, it's generally worth more in our company than it is in the partner's company. And therefore there's an arbitrage in that value. As long as we share that arbitrage with our partners, we generate value for both us and our partners, our new partners. And, uh, and you know, streaming is the only form of transaction where whenever we announce a transaction, we actually, our share price will typically climb a bit and our partner's share price will climb a bit. If we are truly creating value through a streaming transaction. The other one, uh, the other area that I think is really important with respect to mining companies and why would they do a stream is the improvement on the return on invested capital. And I can't give you a better example than Salobo. Uh, Bale operates, uh, owns and operates the Salobo. Uh, it's a copper mine in northern Brazil. It is one of the best copper mines in the world. Um, they, they've got to that point uh, over two phases of, uh, you know, when they originally started, they've already finished off the second phase of expansion. As I mentioned earlier, they're, they're currently constructing a third phase of expansion at this, uh, at, at this global mine. The first two phases cost a total of just under $4 billion to construct, just under $4 billion. Through our agreements with Vale, we supplied $3.1 billion. So we supplied 78% of the capital required to construct this project. And yet our streams where we get 75% of the byproduct gold that is associated with this copper deposit only take about 16% of the revenue away from this mine. It leaves the other 84% of the revenue 
with Valet. So Valet's shareholders, Valet's company, funded only $816 million in capital to get this mine built. It's a $4 billion mine, but they only had to supply capital for $860 million, and yet they still get 84% of the revenue. That 84% of the revenue represented $882 million in EBITDA to the Valet shareholders just in 2018. You can see how dramatically improved the rate, the return on the invested capital is for Valet shareholders. This is why streaming works. Streaming will take a good mine and make it a great mine. Benefits to the community. Um, it's something that, that we're really focused on. As, as mentioned earlier on, I'm a geological engineer that has a, 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 an operating background. I understand how important social license is. And social license, I've been using that phrase long before, uh, uh, or that concept long before it became trendy. But it comes down to being sustainable and making sure that we deliver long-term benefits, long-term value, sustainable value back to the communities where we operate, where we work. So, uh, you know, our core focus in Wheaton is this has always been a core focus for us, and it's really represented in four different areas. Um, first off, whenever we're looking at new opportunities, our due diligence process is very rigorous and thorough on this front. We're always looking for ways to uh, to uh, help and so provide support. If there's things that we see that can be done better, we make sure we share those ideas, but we also learn from our and share that, that knowledge with some of our other partners to try and make sure that we as an overall mining industry are that much more successful in terms of delivering long-term sustainable value. Um, but we are very diligent in terms of making sure that, uh, that, that it comes to that the investments that we make are with partners and operations that have a good track record and are constantly working to improve on, on, on this area of, of expertise. This, one of the other areas that we deliver that back is through our community investment programs. We, we push about one and a half percent of our, uh, of our cash flow back to uh, community investment programs, some of which is around our own employees, but uh, the bulk of which goes back to the communities around the mine sites that deliver us the metal. We've also got strong policies and practices in place within the company. We've got uh, sustainability elevated all the way to the board level. And we, uh, we've uh, last year established a vice president of sustainability within the company itself. And so it is something that's, that, that is, uh, is, is really working its way forward. And then one of the things that I constantly push amongst our senior management is making sure that all of us contribute outside of the job, that take our time and take our efforts and, and make sure that we have external voluntary commitments to deliver value back to society as a whole. The community investment program we had, as I mentioned, one and a half percent of our average net income comes uh, is is based. Uh, we budget based on this. About half of uh, or half a percent, which is about a third of that total, gets spent in the community where uh, our employees live. Here in Vancouver and in the Cayman Islands, we have two offices: one in Georgetown and in, in the Cayman Islands, and one here in Vancouver. And and uh, and constantly looking for ways that we can uh, help uh, make this just a, a better place. But as I mentioned, more importantly, the partner CSR um, program is very, very important to us, and it's very important to our partners. We provide support to help them get stronger social license. This is what the mining industry needs to do as a whole. This is what the streaming and royalty industry needs to do as a whole, is to continue to improve uh, that relationship with our partners. And so we've got good, strong programs we're quite proud of four focus areas, health, education, environment, and community, and all sorts of great examples with Vale and, and in Brazil with Antimina and, and Hud Bay in Peru and with First Majestic in uh, Mexico. 2019 was a, a year that we really stepped up our disclosure with respect to a lot of these efforts. We've been, these programs have been in place for a long time, but we're really stepping up the whole disclosure side of uh, and making some external commitments, uh, some very public commitments in terms of, of how we operate uh, our company. Uh, Wheaton is the top rated amongst DSG analysts, and um, you know a lot of that comes from these efforts of the, on the disclosure side. We're a signatory, of course, to the World Gold Council. I'm very active in the World Gold Council. I'm, I'm vice chair and uh, soon to be um, chairman. Sometime September of uh, 2021, take over as chairman of the World Gold Council. 
the responsible gold mining principles were established last year and, uh, and we're a signatory to that. But we also stepped up and, uh, and we're the first streaming company to join the UN Global Compact, just because we think it's important to, to make a bit of a heavier commitment, a stronger commitment towards the importance of making sure that we deliver value and sustainability back. I can tell you in these times, this is never more important than in times like this. So why invest into wheat and precious metals? Well, let's let's talk with the uh, the precious metals investment thesis in the first place. If you're going to invest into precious metals, typically you the traditional approaches have always been the precious metal miners, mining companies, or bullion or ETFs. Now, the royalty and streaming companies have been around. Royalty's been around for a long time, streaming for 15 years now. Um, and so I would I would say amongst the, these uh, three options of, as ways to invest, you can see Wheaton checks the box on every every um, um, option or every every reason as to why to invest into uh, into or which way to invest into precious metals on a go forward basis. We are pure precious metals, which is very similar to what uh, you have whenever you invest into bullion or an ETF, one of the GLDs. Um, we are pure precious metals. As I mentioned, 60% of our revenue comes from gold, another 35% from silver, and 5% from palladium. We do not and, and will not invest into oil and gas. We think that there's plenty of opportunities for you as shareholders to uh, invest into oil and gas with oil and gas companies. And uh, I don't think there's any logic in us dictating what percentage of your precious metals investment should be directly tied to oil and gas. I just don't understand the logic behind that. We also are not interested in base metals. Uh, precious um, specialty metals like cobalt will form a small part of our revenue stream on a go-forward basis, but we are focused on precious metals. Now, in terms of how we compare to the other streamers, um, you can see that the market metrics have us trading at a bit of a discount. Well, the most important metric that I look at from, a, from any resource company is a PNAV metric, uh, price to net asset value, mainly because everyone's assets have varying lives and qualities, and, and so net asset value is one way to capture that, that future uh, value of, uh, of these assets on a go-forward basis. And so we definitely trade at a discount to our peers on a PNAV basis. And in fact, if we made up that discount, uh, we would add another quickly another one and a half billion dollars. We are gradually clawing that uh, differential back. It has been worse in the past. Uh, I think that given the quality of our portfolio and the tax confidence that we have, uh, and the fact that we're pure precious metals means that we should at least trade on the average of our peers, at least trade on the average of our peers. Compared to uh, owning uh, bullion ETF or uh, mining companies, you can see how Wheaton has delivered from a return basis on multi-year com uh, horizons, multi-year comparison, return comparisons. Um, we, our business model is the strongest uh, way to invest into precious metals. So our track record to date, uh, we're. Uh, since 2004, just over 15 years since we started this company, we've invested $9 billion into the ground. We've, uh, we've generated, uh, well, already generated over six, well over $6 billion in cash flow. Um, a billion of that has been given back, and slightly more than a billion of that has been given back to our shareholders in our dividend program to date already. We continue to have strong annual cash flows, especially at current commodity prices. And when you combine that with the over 60 years of reserves and resources, uh, you can see why this has delivered such strong value to our shareholders to date and will continue to on a go-forward basis. 18% average annualized after-tax return from our portfolio. So this is my last slide, and uh, if anyone's got questions, uh, this is the time to start thinking about uh, forwarding those on. Um, um, but, uh, you know, just to reinforce the strengths of our business model, cost predictability. There's no cost surprises in our company. Highest quality asset base, um, sustainable operations with a lot of active support from Wheaton to our partners to ensure and to strengthen that sustainability and that, uh, that strength within communities to, uh, and, and jurisdictions to, to try and provide that support. 
leverage to increasing uh, precious metals prices. Obviously, we have an operating cost basis, and so we can we deliver strong leverage to that. And the fact that our costs are fixed means that any increase in increasing precious metal prices gets delivered right back to our shareholders. Attractive valuation relative to our other streaming peers. We still trade at a discount to those peers, and we are gradually chewing our way through that discount. Um, I think we should at least trade at the average of what our peers trade at because we have pure precious metals and we also have tax confidence. Um, I can't reinforce the importance of having a handshake agreement with the Canada Revenue Agency um, in terms of the strength of our business model and um, we are confident about our approach on a go-forward basis. And of course, we uh, we have a competitive dividend. Uh, we, we pay you to own our stock. And so uh, all of that adds up to in our eyes, the uh, the best reason to uh, own Wheaton as as an avenue for your what you should be owning in the precious metal space, especially in today's world. So with that, uh, yep. I'd like to hand it back to questions. All right. Um, you could pull out your crystal ball for a moment, and much as you want to answer, do you have a forecast for gold and silver in the next 18 to 24 months? Or does, we, uh, does Wheaton uh, comment on that? Well, here, here's what I will um, commit to is that um, I'm very bullish on precious metal prices, uh, not surprisingly. In today's world, when I look at the amount of, of dollars that are going to need to be printed to restart the economy, and I, and I, I can assure you that, that I don't think the full effect of this global shutdown has truly been measured yet. Right? really don't think it has. It doesn't take much to uh, to see the lack of planes in the air, to see the lack of retail uh, storefronts that are, um, are, are working. Uh, it doesn't take much to see this impact around the world. I really do think that there's going to be substantive, um, for lack of a better word, quantitative easing, <laughs> um, which means a lot of dollars being printed. Uh, I think the IMF came out with a forecast already commitments to date of over eight trillion. I remember, you know, it was only 10 years ago that billions seemed like the big number. Now all of a sudden everything's being measured in trillions. That just so strongly reinforces my belief in precious metals as a, as a, as a liquid, strong store of value, as it has been for thousands of years. Gold and silver, uh, both. Um, so I'm, I'm bullish in, in commodity prices. I, I don't have any problem envisioning gold over $2,000 an ounce. I don't have any problem envisioning silver over $20 an ounce. I'm actually more bullish on silver than I am on gold because because silver just has so many other attributes that uh, that make it attractive from a, from an industrial application, a technical application. It is uh, it is widely used in high efficiency electronics wherever you want batteries to last longer. And in this age of mobility, of working from home, of being connected by smartphones. We all want batteries that last longer. We all want more processing power. Silver will play a role in that. Silver will play a role in that. Silver also has the best antibacterial qualities of any noble metal in terms of filters and water uh, application systems. And I can again, in today's world, um, you know, people talk about how good copper is. Silver is even better than copper in terms of, um, you know, why you know microbial silver really, really keeping. Uh, uh, bacterial um, uh, risk down to a minimum. Yeah. And so both gold and silver, I don't have any problems seeing continued strength there. The bulk of my optimism in that uh, really comes back to the fact that what we're what we're going to see over the next next six months to a year is substantive quantitative easing that will um, will highlight the fact that from a store of value perspective, you do not want to be in the US dollar or the euro or the British pound or any of the fiat currencies around the world. They they work as good exchange mediums, uh, currency uh, exchange mediums, but they, they are not there for a store of value. Could um, uh, the printing press, I guess, uh, 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 wash out any fears of deflation? Mm -hmm. I guess, would you agree with that statement? Um, you know, it's uh, it's always interesting because you would, uh, um, yeah, I, I would agree with that because that's what's going to be required in order to kickstart the the economy is that there's going to be a fine balance, and and I can tell you the, the impression that I wind up uh, coming away from 
is is um, is it's just a house of cards that just waiting for the slightest little hiccup, and then we're going to have some serious serious issues in terms of uh, liquidity, in terms of being able to make uh, everything meet, uh, you know, uh, and and so. So again, I just the stability, the strength of precious metals. I, I think that everyone should have some precious metals exposures in in, in their portfolio. Um, just taking and, and if 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 we look at uh, you know assets under management around the world in terms of funds and private investors and and such, and if we just take five to ten percent of that and put it into precious metals, the demand on 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 gold and silver will see such strength in that space. And I, I don't think there's a time more apparent or more, uh, more more strong to show that strength than there is right now. Um, moving on to more company specific and model specific, um, uh, royal streaming versus royalty. Uh, I guess what are the pros and cons? Which one might you think is better? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, the fact that we're 100% streaming. Uh, highlights which one they think better but then i would also say the fact that the traditional royalty companies have now all swung to streaming companies if you look at our peers franco and royal gold the bulk of their uh, the bulk of their nav the bulk of their revenues come from streams and so it highlights the strength of streams 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 reflect a partnership between two entities to work towards maximizing value and delivering value back to the respective shareholders the respective shake stakeholders Royalty is a registration on land that typically doesn't have good strength of partnership, doesn't have that contractual relationship. Um, you know, people have argued that uh, this, the, the tenure on a, on, on a royalty is better because it'll survive through bankruptcy. I would argue that you just don't invest into assets that have a risk of going bankrupt. And so, uh, you know, uh, why, would, why would you want to focus in that area? Why wouldn't you uh, want to focus on, on profitable partners that have margins? And so, so a stream, as I said, represents a contractual relationship between two parties to deliver value back to all stakeholders. I can tell you it's a very strong relationship. The fact that we have had such strong repeat business from our existing partners to come back and do additional streams with us on other assets in their portfolios. You look at it, most of our partners, we've got two or three assets. Um, in our portfolio from them because streams work so much better. Uh, it's, it's truly a partnership where we can deliver that value. You just don't see that through royalty arrangement. And so there's, uh, there, there's a lot of other ways that streams are, are much more uh, attractive. We actually get physical metal or metal credits delivered to us. We don't get dollars delivered to us. It is ounces and ounce credits that we receive. And so we truly do get exposure to the metal. We're not just uh, collecting uh, uh, checks. And so, you know, it's, it, there's so many strengths to the streaming model that, uh, it, you know, I always point out the evidence of, you know, the best evidence is the fact that the traditional royalty companies aren't royalty companies anymore. They're streaming companies. There, there are numerous streaming companies operating. Um, uh, to much, uh, the best that you can answer, does Wheaton plan on merging with or buying out any, any of them in a general um, strategy? Uh, yeah, I mean, we constantly uh, assess opportunities uh, amongst our peer group in terms of consolidation. And there's no doubt that we have had, uh, you know, <laughs> we, it's been said the ultimate compliment is when someone copies you. And, uh, and we've been complimented quite a bit over the last 15 years. And it seems like more every, uh, every, uh, uh, every day. Um, what, you know, what, what I will say is that uh, probably the best acquisition that we've made in terms of a return on the capital was back in 2009 when we did acquire a competitor uh, by the name of Silverstone. Uh, Silverstone had a number of smaller assets. I, I will say that that generally makes up our third and fourth quartile higher cost asset base, but a number of assets that uh, they, had, uh, they, they had failed in terms of delivering um, confidence back to their shareholders and we saw an opportunity to step in. So we're constantly monitoring a number of these smaller companies to just see if there are opportunities. I will tell you that the strength of the streaming model has also captured the investors out there. Most streaming companies, even if they're small and have uh, high risk assets, do tend to still trade at a premium over the traditional uh, mining companies. And so we still see better return on our capital by chasing streams on new opportunities. Um, that being said, we're constantly watching our peers and uh, 
and especially the smaller ones. And as they uh, have uh, uh, perhaps hiccups or or make bad investments, we uh, we do get to see. Uh, you know, we'll, we wouldn't hesitate to step in and, and do some consolidation if it, if the opportunity arrives. Um, what this is, I guess, pre uh, COVID nineteen. What percentage of revenues come from operations in Mexico, Peru, and Canada? And then, kind of adding to that, um, what do you anticipate that um, those percentages might be due to closures? And um, then also that also affects uh, your gold and silver ratio. Someone commented it was 65 gold, 35 percent silver. Um, uh, is this so? Um, I'll throw that out. <clears throat> sure. Uh, well, Mexico and Peru were very, very important to us when we started the company, mainly because we were focused on silver as we originally started off as silver wheat. Um, Brazil has become very, very important to us now with this logo investment because we do get substantive gold production from uh, from Brazil, and I would. I would say that Brazil is probably about 35% of our uh, of our value on a go forward basis. I would say that that Mexico is probably and, and I'm, I'm sort of uh, I don't have numbers that I'm referencing here directly, but Mexico is probably about 30% of our revenue with the Penisquito and San Damas assets and Los Filos also. Uh, all of those mines have had uh, suspensions uh, in process right now. Um, the uh, Peru, of course, Antamina. Uh, Yali, Yaku, and Constanci are the key investments down there. We've got a, a couple of development projects too, but um, uh, those three assets probably represent again another 15 to 20 percent of our uh, of our uh, total production. And in Canada, of course, we've got Sudbury, we've got Triple Seven, we've got uh, Voices Bay, which uh, we will be receiving uh, some cobalt from starting in January 1st, but the stream isn't active right now. Uh, it's been suspended, but uh, Sudbury is still moving forward. Triple um, Seven is still moving forward, um, and then uh, some development projects at Kino Hill. Uh, Minto has restarted. Uh, they weren't part of our guidance for 2020, anyways. They're still working their way through uh, through moving that forward. So, so I would say Canada is probably even less, probably around uh, 10 to 15 percent of our production right now, because most of it is coming from the Sudbury camp. And the uh, and and triple seven, which is near the end of its life. So Brazil is probably the most important country for us. Uh, this Lobo asset, um, and then uh, I would uh, say Penasquito is second in Mexico. I will highlight that um, you know we're about sixty percent gold, about thirty five percent silver, and then palladium. Of course, the Stillwater mine in Montana is delivering a, a great value to us. Uh, and our timing on that acquisition, we uh, we closed that acquisition back in 2018 when Palladium was trading at around $900 per ounce. Of course, it's well over $2,000 per ounce, and so we're seeing great returns on that investment. That was a $500 million investment with Savanier on uh, on on uh, the Stillwater mine, where we get 4.4% uh, or uh, sorry, 4.5% of their Palladium and 100% of their gold production from the Stillwater mine. And so uh, palladium is also something that uh, that we're quite excited about and think that uh, we see some good uh, support for that over the next while too. Would you consider streams in, in Africa? We we have looked. It really comes down Africa as a continent, of course, political risk is should be measured in the countries. Uh, you know, Botswana and, and, uh, and Namibia are both countries that we'd be very comfortable in. We have looked at assets there. We haven't seen anything of the quality yet that we're comfortable with. Um, uh, we've looked at certain assets in South Africa. Uh, I, I don't think we'd invest into a single asset company in South Africa, but if you had a parent company that had a number of assets out, you know, in and outside of South Africa, we'd probably uh, consider that. Um, there's other jurisdictions in Africa that we have looked at. There are ways for us to temper political risk through corporate guarantees or parent guarantees. I, uh, I constantly have to remind our potential partners that we're in the business of streaming precious metals, not political risk. And so we uh, we do a really good job of focusing on making sure that that, that we don't uh, that we minimize our shareholders' exposure to political risk. So there is a real strong focus on that front in terms of how we uh, we look. We have looked at many assets in Africa. Uh, we haven't closed uh, any yet. Obviously, when we were silver focused, there's not a lot of silver production in Africa, so it wasn't much of a focus area for us. But now that we uh, we are uh, expanded entirely to precious or to precious metals, including platinum and palladium, certain assets in Africa do definitely have some appeal. Do we have any hope for a future uh, for Pascalama? 
You know, I, 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 it was, I mean, it's a classic example of social license and what happens if you, uh, if you break that social license. And, and, and uh, you know, I, from, a, from a technical perspective, it is one of the best gold ore bodies in the world. Uh, and it's, uh, I don't have any problem making the statement that it's the best half-built gold mine in the world. Um, I think that the original plan that Barrick had from a development process perspective was a pretty attractive one. Um, and it seems to me that when we study it and look at optimization processes, it, it shouldn't stray too far from what they were building. Obviously, their costs, they had uh, a real lack of cost control and their costs uh, skyrocketed beyond comprehension through that process. And it's one of the reasons that the project has been um, set aside. Now, that, that being said, uh, with the new leadership at Barrick, what I can tell you is that the Pasqualama is a focus area of theirs. I think uh, Mark uh, Bristow uh, recognizes the quality of the asset uh, and, and constantly is looking for ways um, to uh, continue moving that asset forward. So you know, we, uh, we were of the opinion that Barrick had to have a bit of a change in, in approach, and I think Mark has delivered that change. How it moves forward, we'll see. Um, we still have up until September 30th of this year uh, the option to collapse that stream and get the rest of our money back from Barrick. I can tell you that right now we don't have any appetite to that because we do feel that that mine will eventually become uh, a significant um, uh, producer of gold and to our credit we would get 25% of whatever silver it would represent and it would actually wind up being one of the largest silver mines in the world uh, producing close to 40 million ounces of silver per year based on the original production plan which we see as being a reasonable plan on a go forward basis so we're we're you know currently we're still in long term we do have up until the end of september of this year to decide um as Barrick has not satisfied the completion tests and so we can ask for our money back but uh as it stands right now, we're comfortable um, uh, with uh, keeping that one as part of our optionality. I will say again that there's going to be a real push forward. So when I look around at some of the projects that that that, that we've got as 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 um, optionality in our portfolio, I think there's going to be a real strong push forward from a lot of different countries and jurisdictions around to try and stimulate economic growth especially something that they don't have to support, where the governments don't have to support themselves. And, and assets like Rosemont in Arizona and Pascualama in Chile slash Argentina, uh, to have those projects kickstart um, through, through the course of this process um, on, the, on the tail end of this would deliver real strong economic value back to those communities and those jurisdictions. And so, so I'd say the, uh, you know, uh, but, uh, a process or a pandemic like we're going through right now would actually increase the odds of Pasqualama being successful on a go-forward basis and Rosemont for that matter and Navidad down in Argentina. I'm going to now call on my colleague Stuart McLaver at Amvest Capital uh, who's got some questions. Um, Stu? Hi Randy, Stuart McLaver here. Thanks for your presentation. Appreciate it. Um, got a couple of questions more around geographical exposure and opportunities. Um, firstly, I guess generally the streaming royalty model is uh, better understood in North America compared to Australia. Do you see attitudes changing in Australia towards, you know, the model that, you know, suits you guys? Definitely. I, you know, um, again, Streaming is a source of capital that competes with other sources of capital. And what I would say over the last few years is that Australia has done a really good job of all, already sourcing a lot of capital. They've got a stronger market in the resource sector. They've got uh, a lot of uh, capital regulations or limitations in terms of where a lot of the uh, funds, the Australian-based funds can invest. A lot of them are restricted. that They can only invest back into Australian enterprises, which of course generates, a, you know, again, another source of potential capital for mining enterprises out there. So we have looked at a number of opportunities in Australia. In fact, we're actively current on, on, on one right now. And, uh, and so, you know, streaming hasn't had the same penetration rate in Australia that it, had, that, that it has in other jurisdictions. Um, that, that being said, there are some streams that have been put in place. And, and I don't, uh, you know, I, I think the time will come that there'll be even more streams there. 
is, you know, the, the Australian market has just done a better job of supporting its, uh, its resource sector than, than I think probably any other market around the world. And I think that's probably one of the reasons that, uh, that, uh, that streaming hasn't been as competitive from a source of capital perspective. Yeah, understood. Yeah, the superannuation system forcing them to buy ASX stocks definitely helps. And yes. then, um, you know, with the consolidation or more simplification of geographies for the major mining companies, you know, such as selling off the super pit, for example, in Australia, do you see that as an opportunity for Wheaton to, you know, are you seeing more opportunities for those acquirers of those non-core assets of the majors? Who will need to finance the development or expansion? Definitely. Um, anytime there's any type of a transaction that needs capital, uh, there's an opportunity for us to step in. And one of the things that we've been really uh, reinforcing, um, and, and, it, and it's definitely getting some traction with some of our potential partners, is the fact that when it comes to making an acquisition, having a company like Wheaton stand beside uh, the acquirer during the acquisition can only help. Um, first off, you know, we, we obviously supply capital and you've seen, seen how our contribution of capital uh, greatly um, is, is much larger than the percentage of revenue we'd take away from the stream. It, it, you know, uh, we, I used Solobo as an example in the presentation, but it, it's not any different if, if someone was coming in and buying that asset. The amount of capital we supply is a much bigger percentage than the percentage of revenue we'd take away from that stream. And so the other added benefit is the fact that you've had a second independent technical team review this project. And I can tell you, our objective at Wheaton is to make sure that we invest into healthy enterprises. I can, you know, I, I've seen plenty of examples as, as, as we've seen a lot of competition come into this space, into the streaming space of companies that are willing to do anything to get a stream on an asset and don't realize that if they invest into an asset where you chew up all the profit in, in, in the stream, uh, streaming agreement that the mine will shut down. It won't operate in a go forward basis because why would the operator continue in a go forward basis? And so it's very important for us to make sure that when we go through our due diligence process, that we ensure that we're comfortable with some of those assumptions that have been made. And I can tell you that gets a lot of traction, not so much in the big diversified companies, although, you know, I'd say in the track records, maybe that, <laughs> maybe it should happen a bit more. But why would you ever uh, shy away from a, from a good, strong quality second opinion when it comes to making an acquisition? And so, I, you know, I, uh, we have seen, we've had a lot of discussions that way with, um, with potential partners uh, about standing beside, uh, standing beside them during acquisitions. And, uh, and, and I do see continued opportunities down that, that space. Um, there's just so much, you know, there's a lot of benefits that come with the uh, capital that we supply. Right. Um, well, uh, move over to, to Gabriel Alonzo Mendoza, also of Amvest. Hi, Gabe. Hi, uh, Campbell, and thanks again, Randy, for the presentation. Just a question about, around growth. Um, you know, we've seen sort of, you know, and, and you've mentioned it, lots of competition, new entrants. Do you feel the the space is is saturated? And and then sort of second part to that question is, um, you know, we've seen some new business models uh, come out. Um, in terms of like offering new creative ways to uh, get streams, are is we in thinking about doing anything uh, new or different? Yeah, we've we've already made some changes. I mean, uh, you know, the the worst thing that anyone can do is is get stagnant in terms of um, structure and, uh, and and looking for ways to make improvements. So so we already have most of our new agreements now. Um, the production payment is a percentage of the spot price, not a fixed number. Uh, it's a fixed percentage, which gives us a fixed margin, which is, uh, I would argue, still pretty attractive. Um, but this is uh, this has got some benefits back uh, in terms of um, helping helping the partners on a go forward basis. If we do see a strong commodity price move in, in an upward direction, it protects us on a, on a downside projection uh, uh, projection side. But um, uh, there's other changes that we've seen. I would argue that uh, some of those structural changes are probably chewing up too much of the value. I mean, the one complaint uh, that I would say isn't getting reflected enough in some of the other agreements out there is the fact that the mining industry has a horrific record of delivering on time, on schedule, on budget. And so, so when I see agreements that have 
fixed terms or fixed quantities or buyout clauses. Um, I, I, I look at those things as basically variable term gold loans. They're not really streams. And, uh, and we've seen so many new entrants come into the space that have said, okay, up until this many ounces, or up and or you have a buyout clause as of this date, or you have you, you have to realize that if those buyer clauses aren't exercised, it's only because the streaming company must be losing money or losing value. There's all sorts of uh, uh, challenges on that front. And so, so um, you know, I just see see that as being a a, a real strong uh, issue, um, and, uh, and and just the quality of the uh, of, of those issues on a go forward basis. So, so it is something that I that we watch pretty consistently to make sure that. Uh, um, that there's not good opportunities out there, but but I also caution that some of the uh, some of these new entrants coming into the space uh, um, have had a, a real challenge on uh, on the uh, uh, you know on the structural side, and they're giving up some real uh, some real strength. And, you know, I do find it interesting that we've seen some of those new entrants try and go through um, go public processes uh, and have had failures on both fronts. Um, and so, you know, um, it, it sort of highlights the the strength of a, of, a, of a good stream versus a variable term gold loan. Gentlemen, I'm, I'm, unfortunately, I've got to sign off onto another call here right now that I, uh, uh, so I'm going to have to call it. Uh, the I was just about to ask you if you had more time. So we got more <laughs> questions, but we'll, uh, we'll get to your questions uh, post-show. Uh, let's, closing statement, Randy. Yeah, these are very, very uh, volatile times. Um, you know, we are in great shape from a from a perspective, especially from a relative perspective around the world. Uh, these, there, there's, you know, I, I mean, obviously, precious metals are a very important aspect of and should be. And 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 if it's not apparent yet, you know, open your eyes. It should be a part of every portfolio. Um, but at the same time, this is also a time that charity uh, is no more important than it is in times like this. And so I just think, urge everyone to, uh, you know, obviously take care of yourselves, stay safe and healthy. But if you've got the capacity, you know, there is not a time more important for charity than it is now. And so uh, uh, this is the kind of issue that we as a community work our way through. And so let's, uh, let's all work together. There is light at the end of this tunnel. We will get there and we will be stronger as a result of this. Um, but please stay safe and healthy and uh, make sure you've got some precious metals in your portfolio. And some Perel on your, in your bag. <laughs> exactly. Thanks a Thank lot. Thank you very much. Hey, everyone. The replay will be available in a few hours. Thank you.